happening. And I have a headline right here. Podcasts will account for more than one fourth of digital audio spending in the next few years. This is just an article that just came out last month. Uh, they're, they're talking about, you know, billions and billions. So some people are putting money into advertising podcasts. And uh, I thought Brian Green could, uh, you know, take out all the smoke and, and just right through the, the whole barriers here and understanding what it is and is, is advertising for, for small podcasts, let's say uh, less than 10,000 a month, less than 5,000 a month is, is, should we be paying for ads or should we be accepting ads or, or what level, if I call and say, I have 4,000, are you going to let me put ad? What's the, what's the status? And so that's, that's really what it's all about. It's like uh, from a podcast perspective, how can advertise cast help us? And we tell our friends because I'm meeting with two other people today who are podcasters and, I, I seem to get around. I know people. So, so Brian, you want to jump in and talk about your company and your relationship with Libsyn and how maybe you can help sure. us in both ways? Sure. So it's pretty easy, the relationship with Libsyn. They bought AdvertiseCast. So Liberated yeah. Syndication was bought by a guy named Brad last year. And around that same time, Brad is an investor in the, you know, digital audio space. He has been for a long time. And he came in and bought a majority of the shares of Liberated Syndication. And one of his charges was let's grow a company around, you know, online audio media, mainly podcasting, but now we're getting into vodcasting and, and YouTube and all the stuff that goes along with that. And advertise cast being one of the larger kind of, uh, we don't handle huge podcasts. We're not handling Conan O'Brien. We're not handling you know, the other big names you might hear, the Michelle Obamas or whatever. That's not the type of network that we are. What we're handling is kind of the middle of the pack, larger podcasts. So 10,000 downloads in the first 30 days on up. Now we're, we're looking for other marquee names. That's part of the task we have in 2022 and 2023. But who we really serve are these podcasters who are just getting to a point where monetizing their podcast can make them substantial amount of revenue. And what I, what I mean by substantial is it may not replace your full-time income, but it starts making sense to, to really pay attention to this podcast as a business when it comes to advert, placing advertising inside the business. We all know there's lots of ways to monetize your podcast, selling courses, using it for your business as a marketing platform. There are a million different ways you can make money on a podcast. This, this specific format of driving sponsors into your podcast, um, you know, you, ha you have to get to a certain, you have to reach some critical mass for that to, for you to really pay attention and say, wow, that's, I'm making, you know, a thousand or 2000 or $10,000 a month. All of that said, there is no barrier to entry with AdvertiseCast and a lot of other ad networks because AdvertiseCast, like a lot of other ad networks, has something called an emerging podcast bundle. And what we do is we bundle podcasts that have less than 5,000 downloads per episode um, in the first 30 days. And we bundle those together and we go and sell to the larger sponsors who typically only reserve their dollars for that 10,000 and above. Um, and that is just a simple principle of laziness on behalf of the agencies. The agencies want to get as many impressions as they can and do as little work as possible. And so that's why they buy the bigger podcast. It's not about you know, whether your podcast is more effective than my podcast and driving customers, it's about how much work am I going to have to do to get there? And so we bundle those podcasts together and we sell into sponsors, what's called host red baked in ads. I think everybody's probably familiar with that terminology. I'm in the middle of my show. I take a break. I talk about a sponsor for a minute or two. Um, and that lives in that podcast in perpetuity. It's not supposed to, but it usually does because podcasters typically don't take those out. And we also drive dynamic ads into that podcast. So Spotify um, sells a big advertising campaign to AT&T. AT&T gives the creative to Spotify and says, run it across the platform. And so you can also on AdvertiseCast, you can also get dynamically inserted advertisements or what we call span. Um, and that's another way to monetize your podcast. You make less money on that because you do less work and it's, and it's kind of plug and play. Um, but one of the things that is happening in the podcast space right now that I think is very interesting, that may be more interesting to podcasts that are growing is we're finding that advertising your podcast, podcast to podcast advertising is an incredibly effective way to drive new listeners to your show. And so let's talk about that for a second, because I think that 
I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why you brought me here, right? Is how do I grow my show? And is advertising on my buddy's podcast going to be the right way to do that? Because we've all heard about cross promotion since the day we started podcast, cross promotion, cross promotion, cross promotion. If you've done it, then you know, it's a time consuming, very uh, kind of arduous thing to do. It's like, you have to, con- you have to find somebody that has a similar audience size, you have to find somebody that you think has audience that would listen to your podcast. You have to go out there. You have to knock on doors and throw emails five, six times a day until you reach somebody. And then you have to go through the motions of actually cross promoting. So the thought behind this is very similar, only it's rather than spend 15 weeks trying to get a hold of somebody and seeing if we can coordinate a cross promotion, why don't I just pay you for that? And then you'll pay attention to me much quicker. And also I have a larger, uh, the the ability to choose a larger pack of podcasts. And the quick answer to, is this an effective way to drive new listeners is yes, it is. Um, But let's talk about what that means for a minute for the smaller podcasts, the podcasts that have, or the new podcasts or, or podcasts that have a very specific niche. And so they may never have very large audiences because they're just talking to a few people and that's okay. Um, it's still an effective way to drive listeners to your podcast. I think you have to be more strategic about where you place those dollars. Let's take, for example, um, Buzzsprout made an announcement two or three days ago, if you've been paying attention. Buzzsprout is a large hosting platform also. And what they've put together, they've put together a plug and play solution for you, the podcaster, to go and take a 30 second ad and run it across multiple podcasts for a minimum spend of $100. So, I think it is for $100, you get, I think it's 5,000 impressions. And you can pick the categories that you want to run this in. So the podcast categories that you'd like to run it in. Or you can kind of do a roll of the dice or what they call run of the catalog, right? Whatever they, ha- whatever they have available, they'll spot you first. Buzzsprout uh, is making it very simple for everybody to get in the game of paying to be in front of other podcast listeners. Because there's one statistic that holds true across all of podcasting, and that is the best and most cost-effective way to get new listeners to your podcast is when they're listening to other podcasts. They're open to hearing new ideas. There's a Triton uh, research out there that says that 68% of podcast listeners find new podcasts by listening to other podcasts. So there's just this open door in people's podcast listeners' brain. They're ready to get in there and discover new podcasts. And Buzzsprout is making it easy to do that at a very base level. At you know, hundred dollars is is not a barrier. Is is not a barrier to most people, right? hundred dollars is something that that most people can spend. Expectations should be set correctly. I don't think that hundred dollars is going to double your podcast audience size, I think it's going to bring you a few new listeners and that you can roll off of, right? And then you can build on that. There's an ROI model that every podcaster needs to pay attention to. And that ROI model is how much can I spend to acquire a repeated listener, a subscriber? How much can I spend to acquire them before I start to lose money? I've done a million of these ROI models. And my math tells me that unless you're selling, that means you are selling ads to sponsors at more than $35 per CPM per thousand impressions, that your ROI model is going to fall between somewhere between four and $6 per acquisition. So it doesn't matter who, which podcast you are, right? It's just the simple math. And that only, and that assumes that you're selling ads that assumes that you're making money on the podcast. But let's assume that someday you will make money on the podcast. You still need to adhere to that cost per acquisition. So I, so I think that Buzzsprout is offering something good, but I'm not 100% convinced that they're offering something at less than $6 per acquisition. Um, I think right now this is just a, a play to grow your audience and not really think about that cost per acquisition, right? If you want to build your audience it could be a great thing for you. Um, if you are looking to beat $6, I think you're going to have to spend a lot more than $100 and you're going to have to get frequency and you're going to have to get reach. Uh, there's another way to do this. 
And that is you can do host read baked in advertisements on other people's podcasts. So with Buzzsprout, we're talking about dynamic insertion. You take a 30 second ad that you've pre-produced and you plug it into Buzzsprout system and you run it across their network for however many impressions. The other way to do this is to do host read baked in ads. And that's where you pay one of the, one of your podcast friends or someone else out there in the podcast universe, you pay them to actually do an endorsement for you. I want you to read my ad inside of your show. The challenge, and that is in our experience, that is anywhere between 25 and 30% more effective than doing a dynamically inserted ad. Because if I'm listening to whoever, Jordan Harbinger, and Jordan Harbinger comes on and he talks about Rob's podcast, I'm likely to pay attention to that. Uh, I'm, I'm likely to act on that 30% more of the time than I am if you just dynamically insert a commercial into Jordan's podcast. The challenge with that for emerging podcasts, for smaller podcasts, or podcasts under 10,000 listeners per 30 days is the cost associated with that. A uh, spot on Jordan Harbinger's podcast may cost eight to ten thousand dollars, and that's one spot. Now you're reaching two hundred and fifty thousand people in one shot, um, but there is a real there's a real barrier to entry there when it comes to the smaller podcasts. So I think the answer to the to the question I'm brought here for is: Is there a way podcast to podcast advertising is that effective? Yes. Is there a way to do it in, in a, with the reasonable amount of money? Absolutely. Buzzsprout isn't the only solution out there. Spotify also does this. Um, iHeart, I think, is coming up with a solution. They have, to, they have a $5,000 minimum spend right now, but I, I believe that they're on the cusp of releasing something like Buzzsprout. Um, and AdvertiseCast ourselves are working on something where it's a subscription model. You will pay less than you would on Buzzsprout, um, but you commit to three to six months or, or you know, there's different packages. You commit and you pay a little bit of money every month and then we run you across our network of 3,000 shows um, dynamically inserted. So everybody in the podcast space, like on the business side of it, we're all thinking about um, how we facilitate this kind of advertising, podcast to podcast advertising. It's not a huge moneymaker, but it is helping our podcasts a great deal. Um, and I think it's something that needs to be paid attention to. Uh, by the podcasters and by the people who are facilitating these kind of podcast advertisements, for sure. Go. I'll ask one question and toss it to this of the room. So um, Jordan Harbinger spends forty thousand dollars a month on ads. <laughs> he spends more than that. <laughs> yeah, that's the last figure I saw. Yeah, I looked yeah. it up this morning, but it could be even more than I heard a million a year. That's why I hear it also. Um, yeah. There's another uh, podcaster. Um, I think his name is Ryder R H Y D E R. He had dark net diaries. He's, he's number six in technology. And he did a study where he looked at four or five ways to advertise. And uh, he said, um, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. He said, you know, from his perspective, it, um, it wasn't worth it advertising. So we have one guy who successfully advertised, another guy who successfully doesn't advertise. And so, I mean, I mean, is it only I, the big guys that should advertise or little guys? Or yeah. what do you think about this dark net diaries? You know these guys? I do. They're on our network. Ah. So I know. Uh, Dark Knight Diaries, and I know, and I know Ryder, and I know why Ryder may have said this. First of all, Ryder has a huge podcast. I mean, it's the number one podcast on our network by traffic, uh, three out of the seven days a week. So I know Ryder, and he has an incredibly successful show, and he has sold out down the line. But he has a Dark Knight Diaries is in this weird um, space of technology and mystery and murder and he's in this kind of this weird content space where i think it's hard to describe what writer does in a 30 second commercial and there are some categories where advertising your podcast is le a little bit less effective because it's really hard to describe what you do in 30 seconds and, and writer also he only does one um episode per month typically so this, he's not doing repeated um, episodes, which brings his ROI model down, meaning I, I do 12 episodes a month, my, my podcast. So I might be able to pay just a little bit more for a repeated listener because I'm making more money off each repeated listener, where Ryder is not. He's only, he's making much less. So for him, his, and he's not a stupid guy. He's done the ROI modeling. Jordan is doing four episodes a week. So Jordan also has a similar ROI model to the one that I'm working with. So 
I understand why Ryder may have said that. He may have tested it and found that, you know, I can only pay $2 per subscriber and I'm paying $3.33. So I think that there are X factors in everybody's podcast. I'm also in my ROI model, I'm assuming everyone does at least an episode a week, right? Um, But everyone's ROI model is going to be a little bit different. And uh, Ryder has an extremely successful show and he's done to my understanding, and I've had very little conversation with him about this in depth, but to my understanding, he's done very little advertising also. It's also kind of taken off on its own. Um, so when you have that kind of organic growth, you may find that spending anything for a subscriber might be, you know, it might be painful. But Jordan, there's a, Jordan's not an unintelligent human being, and I've spoken a lot more with Jordan than I have with, with Ryder, admittedly. But uh, Jordan is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on podcast to podcast advertising. If you go to Apple's top 12 and you listen to them right now, it's likely that in at least five, you'll hear Jordan's host read baked in at. I can tell you right now, those are those commercials cost tens of thousands of dollars for one spot. And the reason why he's doing that is because he knows it works, right? Um, and he's been doing it for a number of years. He's a, he advertises on my show and he bought the entire year. No other sponsor has ever done that. He, he did three test ads and then he bought the entire year. And so I, I know from personal experience from my own show and then from working on the business side that, you know, Jordan is onto something. Um, and we also know just from testing our own methodologies that, that it works. It doesn't work in every single case. Um, but by and large, if your ROI model stands between four and six dollars, you, you can make money. And but the other thing, too, is, is that you have to put a degree of, of strategy into this. You have to put some nuance into your, into the way that you go about placing these ads. Let me give you an example. And I'm, I'm, this is not my political affiliate. This, I don't want to talk about politics. I'm just going to just use this as an example. Let's, there's a guy on our network. His name is Mike Pesca, and he has an incredibly successful, longest running daily news podcast called The Gist. The Gist is a center left leaning podcast, and he wanted to do some podcast to podcast advertising. So he came to me and we had a discussion about this. And he says, well, I want to go on Rachel Maddow. I want to go on NB- MSNBC. I want to go on Al Franken show. You know, I want to do all this, right? And we ran a couple of those ads and it was effective. It met the model, but it wasn't incredible. It wasn't something that really stood out. And I thought about this for a few seconds. And I said, if I'm listening to Rachel Maddow's podcast for four years, and I'm a Rachel Maddow listener, I may not be likely to jump off of Rachel Maddow's show in the middle of the show and go try out some unknown entity because I'm just fine with Rachel Maddow. That's just how human beings work. We like what we like and we stick with it. We're creatures of habit. What if you ran that same campaign, those same amount of impressions, but let's do it on comedy and true crime networks where people may be looking for a news program that they don't already have in their you know, repertoire. And when we did that, he did, he did half a percent better on the conversion rate than he did with running just the new shows. And so I think that when you do this, you have to put a little thought and strategy behind it so that you can maximize, like you said, the squeeze. Um, If you just throw something at a wall and see what sticks, you you know, when you sense that, when you see the data back and you go, oh, that's doing better than this, then go in that direction until you run that course and then you go in another direction. So I've got a lot of questions. I'm going to toss it over to David or Chad or Lauren, whoever wants to jump in. I got a question. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, when you when you're climbing into the social media world, and you know, certainly five six years ago, and the people are you know starting to tweet a lot more. At least business authors and podcasters, etc. Uh, there was a way to you know. I even used a couple of them. You could just find people uh, for not too much a month who would just basically. Uh, you know, pump up your Twitter numbers, uh, find you Twitter followers, not any of the nonsense of just the, the bots, but I mean, just tr- tweet for you, just kind of maintain that, um, that rhythm. If you didn't have the time for it, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but I'm just telling you, um, I, and, and it worked for me personally. Are there, are there small companies out there that will just kind of basically chip away and chew away at, at getting listeners? Is there a science to that part of it? Because I'm not fitting your large category by far. I'm struggling to get in your medium category, but I'm getting close. But um, is, is that a viable alternative just to have, you know, kind of a, a college kid or somebody that's just looking to, to kind of um, 
not tweet for you, but basically just do little pieces to keep get, get your name out there. You, so is it, you I mean, is there a way to get somebody else to, to Yeah. Uh, to I mean, are there companies out there that do that? They, and they may be sole proprietors, but um, is that yeah. a way of growing an audience? Yeah, I think it's building community is, if you have an engaged community of, I would, I would take a, an engaged community of a thousand listeners than, than a non-engaged community of a million listeners all day long because the thousand listeners, if I had sponsors on my show, would respond to the sponsors. And that's what makes the money. It's not the first buy, it's the comeback, right? Got it's it. that, you know, if you do better help, you want them to continue to buy from you because a one-off is great. It makes you a little bit of money, but it's really if they buy for the year, right? If they buy for the year, then, then that's really where it's at. So I think building a community is always... Well, I mean, I think anybody who's been doing this for a while would say, I'd love engaged listeners. That's what I want, engaged listeners. Because downloads is a vanity metric at the end of the day. It can make you money, but it can be a vanity metric. If no one responds to your sponsors or responds to you, then what does it really matter? There are comp lots of companies that do this. I mean, there are hundreds of maybe thousands, I don't know, companies that do internet marketing and social media marketing. But there's a place called Fiverr. And there's a place called yeah. Upworks that's owned by Fiverr, I think. Um, and both of those places are great places to go find qualified, capable people that can do this type of stuff for you. I think Upworks is kind of the more buttoned up place to find people. They may cost a little bit more. You may pay, you know, I don't know, 20 or 20, 20 or $30 an hour to have somebody do this, where Fiverr, you might be able to find somebody to do it for $5, but just you get what you pay for often. But we have had help from both of those places in managing or promoting our podcast via social media. Um, you know, but it's this, the, the, that's kind of the slow and low way to grow an audience. You gain one dedicated listener at a time. You hope that they share your podcast with another person who becomes a dedicated listener and so on and so forth. Um, but those engaged audiences, the community builders out there, they, they have something very special and that you can monetize that every day of the week. Right, I appreciate that. And I'm going to check out Upworks. A, a word of, I'll just tell you a Fiverr or Fiverr, however you say, um, you know, great on certain things, graphics, things like that. I actually did engage somebody who had done some graphics for me from Fiverr and um, to grow the podcast audience, sort of what I've been describing. And it was not successful, not because he wasn't a hell of a nice guy, but Everything he wrote, uh, because he wasn't from this country, uh, made me sound illiterate. <laughs> so every and so I had to take his ability to write anything on his own and handle it myself. And at the end of the day, I was pretty much doing everything because I couldn't actually turn him loose. So a lot of them aren't don't have a great command of the English language. So I'm just giving you a word of what of caution for everybody here. Um, if you do find one, and I'm going to check out that other one, I I, I agree, you get what you pay for. Uh, I'm all every day I'm of all, the week, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, you just got to be careful if they're actually producing words for you. Beware. I found my voiceover artist on Fiverr, and I will never use anybody else. He's the most professional, buttoned up, nicest guy I could have ever met, and I. I found another uh, uh, young lady there who does some voiceover work for us too. And, and so I've, I struck gold in that sense, but you're right. And some of the marketing copy stuff, some stuff that I did that required writing, um, you, just, you just buyer beware because uh, we had somebody doing our show notes for a while and I found myself doing the show notes every time he sent me something, I found myself doing the show notes again. So uh, um, yeah. Any questions, David, John, Lauren, Chad, anything jump in here? Yeah, I, I had a similar experience. I hired uh, someone on Fiverr, paid him, I think it was about 120 bucks to write um, like a, about a 10 page um, article and uh, the graphics and all looked great, but, uh, and the content was pretty good as far as the content was there. It just was obviously English as a second language and a lot of the phrases and stuff were really awkward and not anything a native English speaker would, would write. And so the amount of editing it took to make it usable was just, I mean, I, I could have just started from scratch, I think. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, but, you know, and, and, but I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying use them for certain things, it, putting together your words that can be a rough one. Um, but I'm going to check out um, what you had mentioned, Ryan. 
yeah, Upworks. Upworks yeah. I, I'd like to pay a little bit more to make sure that I don't sound like I uh, don't know how to speak. I think John. Upworks goes through a more of a vetting process there, yeah. and then you can choose which, um, if English is their first language, even English or second language, are they here in North America? Are they? So there's a little bit more finesse to Upworks. Um, there's also a time management system where you put money into an escrow account and you don't release that until they actually do the work and, and it's approved. And there's a process by which you can you know, say, hey, listen, I didn't get what I wanted and Upworks will step in and they'll manage the conversation for you. So, um, but again, you know, there, those are super qualified, perfect. Like we're, we have somebody doing all of our video editing and production and you know, $40 an hour, but that's okay because I, I'd prefer to pay a little bit more and, and have it be right the first time. John Miller, got a question. Jump in, John Miller. Hey, sorry if uh, I, you already talked about this. I came in a little late, so thanks okay. for having me. You're welcome. I, I had a question about measuring some some stuff, and and I sure. don't really want I don't really want the um, the specifics of how you measure. It's more conceptually. One thing you talked about was a forty four to six dollar, you know, return on investment to get a listener. So um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that a situation where you would say I spent a hundred dollars for X, and my goal was to get a listener? And from that $100, you got 25 new listeners or repeat listeners. Is that kind of what we're talking about with that yeah. 4 to $6 return on investment? Yeah, v exactly what we're talking about. And I will be happy to share inside of the Facebook group my ROI model that everyone can plug and play with. Great. There are Great. lots of different X factors. So if you don't know what something is, just leave it alone. And But basically, you put in your downloads per week, and it's assuming that you're selling ads at $25 per CPM. That means someone's buying ads from you at $25, which is the kind of the average of the average $25 per thousand impressions downloads. And then you can look at, and then at the end of the spreadsheet, after a million different X factors, then it says I can spend this much per listener. Um, and I've been using this since, you know, when I started my podcast, I, I knew it's a little bit of an arms race going on in podcasting right now. We have a real discoverability problem. It's always been there, but you can't get you if you want to be heard you have to be found if you want to be heard you have to be found and in order to be found you have to pay to get in front of people right so, so you're 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 like my wife you're like three steps ahead of me so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying <laughs> i can only imagine what your feet are doing on her desk they're probably <laughs> anyway so only imagine there's, the there's, frustration there's... of your wife go ahead Stop please. It. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we're having like multiple conversations so one as a podcaster i want new listeners number yeah. two as a podcaster, I want to sell ad space. I want to monetize my podcast. It's kind of a kind of a feedback loop here, whether it's a positive feedback or negative feedback loop. So to get new listeners, I should expect to pay, I should pay someone an average of four to six dollars to get a new listener. And yes. then on the flip side, if I was gonna if I was gonna then sell space in front of my listeners, it's that 20, 25 hour per thousand downloads in the first 30 days. Yes. Am I am I following along correctly? The other thing, yes. so the, the other part of this, so so there's two conversations and I'm okay with the first one. If I want to get new listeners, a, a cost-effective way to keep that in mind is that four to $6 per new listener. Yep. On the other side is if someone was advertised with me, I'm going to charge them to do it. How do you measure if both of those things are happening effectively? So if I spent money to get new listeners, I know I spent for this ad. I go on someone else's show or my, my read is in someone else's show 30 days later, I have a hundred more listeners and it costs me X number of dollars per listener. Is that, is that how we're measuring effectiveness of that part of it? Yes. The other side of that, if someone advertises with me and they pay me 20 to 25, how do we, how do we know if it was effective to them? Do you know what I mean? So it could be a podcaster. Yeah. Rob could say, Hey John, I want you to do a host red ad on your podcast. And he's going to look at his downloads and go like, oh, cool. I did the host red ad on, on John's podcast. And oh, look, I have 100 new listeners. So he can measure effectiveness that way. Are there other ways to do that? I know that was twofold. Are there, and anybody are there, can answer. Are there other ways to measure the effectiveness? Correct. Okay, yes. That's a great question. And there is. So one of the, because podcasting is so decentralized, really getting incredibly accurate information is very difficult to do from most hosting platforms. Chartable, the company Chartable, I'm sure everybody knows about it. Spotify bought them, blah, blah, blah. They have offered and are still going to offer regardless of whether or not they're in the Spotify ecosystem, something called a smart link, 
This is only going to be effective if there is an actual thing to click and some like Buzzsprout. I'm listening to an advertisement. I'm just going to walk through an example. I'm listening to an advertisement on Spotify. I pay Spotify to run Brian's commercial. On Spotify, they're soon going to have a banner ad that comes up along with that. Chevrolet, Brian's podcast, whoever. They're going to have a banner ad. I click on that banner ad. If I put Chartable's smart link in that banner ad, right? Chartable is going to track what happens to that listener. Do they become a subscriber? Do they download any of my episodes? Okay. That's one way that you can do that. But the best way to do this without, you know, spending other money or, you know, having other methodologies, the best way you can do this is to drive someone to a centralized location. And then you can start to understand like a website, right? So briangreen.com or tcbpodcast.com. So when I do the host read for John Miller, I say, you know, John Miller, my good buddy has a podcast. Make sure you go there and listen, johnmiller.com for more information, right? Johnmiller.com to connect with the podcast, johnmiller.com for all the episodes, whatever. Then what people are hearing is johnmiller.com that I could go and search that on Spotify and find John's podcast. That's one way. But the other way is that I could go to johnmiller.com. If I go to johnmiller.com, then I, John Miller, John Miller has a very easy way to start seeing if, if this is driving traffic. Um, so, you know, there's a little, again, you got to put a little shine on it. You got to do it a little nuanced, but let's say that you just had a, an ad that said, you know, John Miller podcast, find on all major podcast platforms. And then you're like, well, how in the heck do I track any of that? You look for trends inside of your analytics. That's what you do. So most, most like my analytics on megaphone will say, Spotify month over month increased by 115%. Traffic increased by 115%. Or I can look at the unique listeners for that time period and see if they increased over a period of time. Because I know one thing about podcasting is that it's highly unlikely that anybody that's not Conan O'Brien, Dak Shep, or Joe Rogan, whoever gets you know all this attention, time, and energy by the media, it's highly unlikely that people are just going to start showing up to your podcast randomly in droves. Why did, did something go viral? Did, you know, your aunt Betty throw it to 3 million people on her Facebook group? I don't know, but looking at those trends can give you a pretty accurate picture of what's going on with that advertising campaign. Which is one of the reasons why I often tell even the largest podcasts that we help um, drive new listeners to, you know, let's do one methodology per week or per month so that we can really get some data that's accurate. Let's not, you know, let's not pollute the data essentially. So that's, that's, that's a very scientific concept. When you, when you're in science, you don't want to change too many variables because you never know which one caused the change. If you do that, you change one yeah. thing, you measure it, you look at it, you, and then move on and try another one after that. So marketing for the, should be answer. the same way. Yeah. Marketing should yeah. be the exact same way. Yeah. My, my opinion, that's how I approach it. Mr. Hop's got his hand up. Go ahead, David. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, Brian, you were talking about, uh, you know, going to a landing page. Um, I'm curious, uh, does anyone uh, do a, like a sign up where you have someone subscribe to an email list and then you email them uh, when you put out a new, whenever you put out a new episode? Um, and would that, like, would you rather send someone directly to the the podcast page or a landing page? And if you have the landing page, would it just link out to the different uh, podcast pages or would you do a email sign up? I'm just wondering what, what different approaches people take. Great question. So Chartable, the smart link that I was talking about, Chartable, that link, you have an, if that link does not click, like let's say I, I see it in a Spotify ecosystem, that link would go to the Spotify page for, let's say it's my, my podcast, the Commercial Break Podcast. But let's say I found that link on YouTube and I clicked on that link. That smart link, why it's smart, is because it will open up the last podcast player that that phone or that desktop pulled up. So if I often use Apple Podcasts, smart link, chartable, that smart link will pull up Apple Podcasts and it'll pull up that podcast page. So that smart link is, is actually smart. It does something for you. It drives people in one click to their favorite podcast player and to your page on their favorite podcast player. So 
my opinion on this, and this is borne out in so many campaigns I've been a part of and just data that I've read over the years of being uh, in marketing, the more barriers to entry you give somebody, the less likely it is that they're going to jump over those barriers or more hurdles you give them, the less likely it is they're going to give hurdles. If I am interested in David Huff's podcast, because I just heard it on Brian's podcast, and he says, go to davidhuff.com slash Brian's podcast, and I go there, and then it's sign up for my newsletter, and then I'll email you about my podcast. I'm going to go, whatever. So, and, and people are over it to a certain degree. So what I would do is get them engaged in the podcast in as few clicks as possible, in as few hurdles as possible. You want them to listen to the podcast and make that, let them decide whether or not they're interested. And then in the podcast, I would say, I got some really exciting stuff for you. I send out a newsletter once a month. I don't spam you. You know, I've got some, a 15 minute show that I do just for my email subscribers. It's exclusive content to my email subscribers where you're going to get more great information. So do me a favor and run over to my website and subscribe and we'll send you a free, I don't know, you know, cookie or whatever, you know, you got to add value to get people to jump over those hurdles. Asking them to listen to your podcast is not a particularly huge hurdle, but if you add three or four things in between that, I can almost guarantee you your effectiveness on that campaign is going to go way down to the bottom. So just be mindful. Yeah, good, good opinion, strategy. Min it. Minimize friction and then uh, promote yeah. the promote the newsletter in the podcast. Yeah, I actually use the um, I, I'm I've, I've run a a blog in a sense uh, for 13 years. Very predictable every two weeks, and and I have that sign up, and I have something I give people when they sign up, and, and you know that's that's running very well. Thank you for your help, David Huff. Uh, but um, I I don't you know to me I don't see mimicking that for a podcast but i do see continuing to use the um, blog i call it a blog article but the but the blog as a way to try and uh populate that podcast because i can talk about it because i can i do have a, a fairly healthy list um and a sign up so uh, but i i agree with you I, ju I just think if you do write a blog you can probably get more listeners to the podcast be, through those signups but i i don't mail out when i've got a podcast coming up um only a, a blog and it's every other week they're 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 not often but two real fast things one um uh, i'm glad you talked about that smart link because uh chartable whatever it is they've been after me on this smart link and i'm looking at it going I, I i got about three quarters of the way there and i went am i getting spammed am i you know what is this again <laughs> you know because it, 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 it's like um david can speak this from a website how many times do all of us get these things that are very slick about hey time to sign you know renew your website and it's not your host it's somebody else kind of trying to swoop and take you so i'm glad yeah. you cleared that up that that's just not somebody kind of you know t taking information and putting it someplace away from uh the you know spotify and things like that uh yeah so good all right that wasn't really a question so my question is this and i'm done the fellows here have made fun of me by don't remember but it hurt my feelings i was hurt about six months ago excuse me i'm over it somewhat but i mentioned the fact that hey what about this idea because i've got some big fortune 500 companies there's no way they're going to pay for an ad on my my uh podcast yet but I actually do believe I could talk a Toyota into a free ad on my podcast. And, and why I would do it is just for credibility of having Toyota as an advertiser on the podcast. And maybe that puts an idea in people's heads. Brian, what do you think of that? I think that if you uh, walk like a duck and you talk like a duck, people are likely to believe that you're a duck. And I agree with this. I think that, you know, some people are, they're, and, and I was like this when I first podcasting and mainly maybe that was because I, I didn't have any listeners and there was no way Toyota was going to be on my podcast. Right. But I was like, advertisements are just going to ruin the podcast. But the truth is, is that I'm spending a lot of time in here creating and I'm not asking anybody to pay me directly. I'm just asking you that if you're ever in the market for my sponsors, products or services, please use my code. Right. But the, the truth is, is that we all listen to a podcast as podcasters and probably as just listeners, if we can ever remember back then when we were just listeners. And when we hear ads, professional ads on a, on a podcast or big fortune 500 companies, we think to ourselves, wow, that, that podcast, they're, they're really doing well. 
So I think there's something to this is that, you know, remember the real estate gurus back in the, the television guys, you know, whatever his name was, the, the guy would run around with the, he'd have the boats and the beautiful women and the fancy cars and the houses. And it turns out the guy lived in a box. He would just <laughs> rent all this stuff or convince somebody to let him film for the day. And he turned out to be a, a, a legitimate billionaire because he just faked it till he made it. And I'm not encouraging anybody to be dishonest to your, to your uh, listenership. Never do that. But if you tell Toyota, I can, you know, if Toyota sells one car on your podcast, it's worth them running an ad on your podcast. Right. So I go to the local dealership, uh, call the marketing department, you know, whoever it is. I think that that's not a bad idea and say, I'm going to run it for free. Don't worry about it. It's now the, you know, the Rob uh, Joel's uh, Toyota studio that I'm broadcasting from or whatever. I don't think that's a bad idea, actually, because okay. I think it makes you sound like, you know, you... So so can we keep going point. with that? Does Advercast or any other places that uh, will do dynamically inserted stuff, do they have a model where they're willing to, if there's a podcaster like Rob or, or someone else who says, hey, I'm willing to give away ads for the next month just to kind of prime the pump. Does Are there any services that are into that now? That's a great question. We, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't even ever think I've heard of anybody coming onto the platform and just offering free advertisements for, for time because usually when they come onto the platform, they're looking Rob, to Rob, do you want to be first? <laughs> yeah, I'll be first. But Absolutely, I, I'll be I first. Think, I, I it's think not, called, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not losing uh, money on it right now. It's not like I'm going to lose money on that idea, right? Listen, I mean, there's lots of advertisers out there who will also do the, the cost per acquisition model, right? Uh, I think there's a, I, I don't know if I want to say it here, if this is going to be broad, broadcast on Facebook, but Shave My Bop, there's a company out there called Shave My Bop, and you know what the bop is, right? And they will pay you money every time that someone uses their code they'll pay you like twenty dollars right and so you keep you do their commercial and then every time someone uses your code to sign up they give you 20 bucks it's a cost per acquisition model it's basically a commission based and there's a, there are a number of companies that do that um go ahead john i want to you know i understand the roi model of ads and ads and i want to switch to something completely different a corporate model so there are companies that have podcasts that are interested in brand awareness and increasing reach. Okay, mm -hmm. and so uh, so let's say we have the uh, uh, the John Miller podcast, and he just doesn't he just wants increased reach and brand awareness. And so um, if they buy ads through AdvertiseCast, how would they measure that? I mean, is there a way that's done through podcasting? There, there's a way that that's done throughout time with with television and with radio and with newspaper and with all the other places that have ineffective of uh, the inef in, the inability to measure the jump between sight and action or hearing in action. It's there's a huge gap there, and companies like McDonald's they are at the point where it's not about did you buy a milkshake because you heard you know did you click and buy a milkshake. It's about overall are we raising the tide are the boats floating a little bit higher um and so and, and that's same with chevrolet so many others but there there are more and more companies like mcdonald's and at&t and these companies who don't really measure you know it's not a direct response campaign there are more and more companies that are getting into advertising and that's where you're seeing a huge increase in advertising dollars is coming from these large branding agencies um, and, and they're spending more and more money on podcasting because podcast listeners are just more likely to act on what they hear because it's the new medium. They're dedicated to the people that they listen to and they're paying attention. Um, they don't, you know, I, I've worked for clear channel for a long time and, um, you know, their measurement tools are extraordinarily broad. And if I, put a commercial in Atlanta, I ran a McDonald's campaign on two nine, you know, double two double cheeseburger dollar ninety nine. And I ran it across this particular subset of radio stations. Did we increase sales on the dollar ninety nine cheeseburger? And then how much did that overall did that store get sales by person, right? And so they measure these things in real broad strokes because that's what a branding campaign is. It's real broad strokes. It's just that there are companies that are investing lots of money into podcasts and there's inevitably there's the, uh, you know, the John Miller, they're going, 
okay, buddy, what's the ROI on this? I mean, you know, we just can't do this for fun. I mean, there's got to be, and I'm just wondering, I think some big companies may do uh, focus groups or surveys or something. Yeah. I don't know if you had an experience in that, you know, it's uh, I don't have any experience being in a focus group, but I, I mean, I have experience t sitting down with agencies and looking at uh, effectiveness of campaigns. Yeah. And again, it's just in really broad strokes and every company has different, you know, they have different levers that they want pulled. McDonald's might want the $1.99 cheeseburger sold. It's not about the $1.99 cheeseburger. It's about what they bought after that, right? Did they buy uh, two more Happy Meals or whatever because they came in the door? Um, and Chevrolet might say, did we sell more, you know, volts this month than we did mm -hmm. Suburbans or whatever? Um, so it's just, you know, those companies, they're just looking for super broad awareness because they want you to think of Chevrolet when you think of a new car. Go ahead, Hello. John. I'm yeah. sorry. Jump in, John. I have two questions. Sorry, sorry if this has already been answered or this is uh, too lowbrow for you. So one, um, <laughs> what is the term that for Shave My Bop where you, maybe they don't pay for the ad, but there's a code or is that affiliate marketing? What, what is the term? Yeah, if you went to like Shave My Bop and said, um, hey, I want to do this thing and you don't have to pay me anything, but I'm going to put an ad. I'm going to read the ad and you're going to give a code. And then every time somebody uses that code, you're going to know it was from me and, and the you're going to see how, now. is that, is that, would be that be the term? Yeah. That, that's one way to put it. And they also do, it's also called commission based marketing um, is another way or commission based commission, direct response, commission based direct response. There's a couple of different things that the agency who sells these, who are trying to sell this idea might call it, but there are lots of these out there, guys and girls like this is the, there are many companies that do this to you know one degree of success or another um and you know when i was no, I first starting out i might have i might have done it if someone had come and approached me for it right so. right so i know i said two questions it just turned into three i'll make it short sure. i'm really sorry if you're going to shave my bot who am i bop bot whatever <laughs> sounds like a robot but anyway if you're going to that company who are you asking for to talk to i'm going to call the marketing the department so just someone in the marketing department hey i got this great idea for affiliate marketing and if you do this and and then the third question is and I, I keep going back to this and John Gilroy, thank you for jumping on measuring stuff and success. Some companies might not have a real firm handle on how many double cheeseburgers they're selling every month. Mm. And if they're really trying to sell double cheeseburgers, a lot of, I don't know, I would think most companies I'm big on measuring and, and keeping track of. So, but many companies might not, hey, we're not selling as many cheeseburgers and I don't really have a hard number on a hard way to measure that but I want to sell more. So we're going to try this thing. What if there's a company that really isn't measuring it that well? Is, is there, a, what would you tell them to, you know, to, to convince them that some kind of affiliate agreement or commission-based thing might be good for them? Because again, it gets back to how do you measure it? And if they, some may not be able to measure it, is there something you would tell them to convince them that having a spot on your podcast could be a good idea? If they're not measuring the well, ROI, like if right, 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 they should be, but they might not be. There, there might be some people that don't have a firm grasp on it. They just know they want more. So I hear that a lot. Yeah. Hey, how many listeners do you want? I want a lot. Okay, what's a lot? You know, yeah. how many do you want next month? More. Well, what's more? I mean, we know one is more, but some I mean, people to may be not. Honest have. with you, that's the ideal client. Someone who's like, I'm not really <laughs> sure what I'm doing, but I like more of it. Right? That's the ideal <laughs> client because when we get at when when. Um, I'm just speaking as a podcaster here. When I get a, a, a commercial and they say, uh, Brian, read, um, you know, uh, whatever is Calm, the app, right? Where's one of our sponsors right now? Go to calm.com. They don't give a TCB. They don't give a whatever. I'm, I don't know if they have a tracking code or not. Um, meaning sometimes they embed tracking codes so that they can, you know, watch people as they move along the path. Um, but, you know, one of these... Um, healthcare companies uh, where you sign up for online mental health, they were a sponsor of ours and they had a code and they wanted us to beat that code into the ground right? because they wanted to know that. It's still an incredibly ineffective way to track because if I'm having in mental health distress, I'm not thinking about the commercial break comedy podcast. I, am, I might go to whatever that online portal is because I heard it on the commercial break, but am I gonna put in slash TCB? Probably not. And so it's still an incredibly ineffective way to measure, but we can extrapolate some things from the few people who choose to do that. And so, you know, I would say that most savvy marketers have figured out some way, whatever works best for them to pay attention. It's just like us podcast to podcast advertising. 
looking at trends is a horribly ineffective way <laughs> to track what's going on, but it's the best that we got. And since it's the best that we got, then we better, you know, make some informed conclusions from the best we got. Outstanding. I, I've got 30 more questions. If you love I'm here. Here. Let's jump in well, I'm there. here. What time is it? Yeah, can, I got time. You, I got two time. of I got them, maybe. Left. We got to go yeah. 30 with you? Two. Uh, at least two. 30. Or, no, or as Miller have... would say, two that become seven, but, but two. Uh, yeah, there's only a couple here. Uh, at the Libsyn site, they talk about IAB certified. Hmm? I have no idea what that means. IAB is a committee. IAB's, yep. I think it's the IAB International is, Advertising Bureau certified it, listeners. It is. You know what I mean? Yep. I mean, so if I go up to Drob and go, hey, uh, uh, put an ad in my podcast because I have 10,000 a month listeners, and those are IAB certified listeners, is that a difference, a qualitative difference, or just was <laughs> Most agencies these days won't buy unqualified, un IAB certified. Uh, but now there are different stages of IAB certification, and it means different things to different hosting companies. So, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call anybody out by name. I know this is gonna be reposted on Facebook, but there are some <laughs> that there are some hosting companies that are much more loose with their interpretation oh. of IAB certified. And so <laughs> Megaphone and Libsyn pretty, you know, they helped, uh, Libsyn is one of the people who helped to kind of push this IAB certification. There's gotta be a standard. He, let me give you an example. I had a client and he has six and a half, six and a half million followers on Facebook, six and a half million. million. He's incredibly popular on Facebook, but his podcast is, doesn't have six and a half million, right? And so when Facebook started running podcasts, his traffic on his podcast went through the roof. It went from 100,000 a month to 600,000 a month in a night. I mean, it just went exploded, wow. it went gangbusters. And we, I couldn't understand why. And this guy was really excited. Oh, I got, you know, everybody on Facebook finally found my podcast. Everyone's into it, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, uh, if it's an anomaly, there's something... Anomalies usually don't make sense, right? There's something there, but it's usually not because what happened? All of a sudden, all your Facebook listeners, all your Facebook fans decided they liked your podcast. That's, that, that's unlikely. And just because Facebook started putting podcasts out there, now they decide that it, I'm like, listen, I'm cautioning caution here because I don't think this is true. The company that he was hosted with was, it turns out that what Facebook was doing is everybody who had the app downloaded on Facebook and liked this guy's page, they were downloading every time he put a, an episode out there, they were downloading it onto their app to manage the flow of traffic, their server traffic. They were basically data managing so that they didn't get crushed by podcasts, right? So that they didn't, their servers didn't crash because, you know, everyone was now calling all of these incredibly popular podcasts. But that wasn't a true download because no one requested it. No one requested it. And as a matter of fact, people didn't even know it was there. It was just if they happened to find the podcast on Facebook, you know, and they happen to like this guy, it would be there ready to play once they got there. But every other hosting platform out there figured this out in a day, in a night, they figured it out. They were like, nope, this is not a true call. What they call it true call, right? This is not a true call. You didn't, no one requested it. No one asked for it. It's just a ping on the server. That's all it is. But this particular company he was hosted with, let this roll for 60, 90 days until they sent him an email one day and said, actually, it turns out that we can't count this if we want to be AIB certified. And so we turned off the spigot and it went right back down to 100,000. So he, he, wanted, he believed what he wanted to believe, right? And I can't blame him for that. I, I, would, I would, if it was my podcast, I'd be like, oh shit, I just became the most popular podcast ever. But the truth was not the truth, right? It was just a uh, smoke and mirrors. And so everybody's IAB certification holds to a little bit of a different standard. And so I caution against thinking that one down, like download to download, everything's going to match. If you move from one hosting platform to the other, it's likely you're going to see your numbers change. And did Lipson, that guy have to send the Ferrari back, or he did, did he get a? <laughs> he well, he had to call the bad network and say all these numbers I've been selling. Eh. His you wife know. got the car. <laughs> listen the guy makes a ton of money on facebook you know what i mean yeah, like he, he's yeah. five, six million followers on facebook you're not you know so you that makes sell. me think of there's there's something in magazine subscriptions called a con continuous service model where you sign up for a magazine and they will automatically renew you unless you ask them not to 
Yeah. Once you give your credit card, it's somewhere in the fine print. You have to uncheck a box if you don't want to renew. They let you, yeah. and they usually most places don't give you too much of a hard time because that would be a real problem. But it's this continuous service model where it automatically does something unless you ask them not to do it, and it is kind of hinky. I read somewhere that thirty percent of subscription based sales don't come from active people. They come from people who just forgot to cancel the subscription. Uh -huh. I think the internet actually has was like born on the back of adult websites that just did that forever. I mean, 